that cold intro this, which we'll be talking about when we do the cold open. I'm trying to think. <laughs> we're doing this. It's weird because usually when I just start the cameras, we're already talking about something. We get like a weird, stupid cold open. Maybe the not having a cold open can be the cold open. We did it. We're going to go meta. We're going to have the no, the no cold open cold open today. <laughs> <laughs> or we could just have silence. Just the two of us. Just staring at each other. Preparing. That's right. Yeah. In, in our in our very similar YouTube rooms. <laughs> uh, well, hey, everybody. Impersonate Ash. No, you did great. You got the lighting perfect. You got my weird grow light lighting that's behind me right now. Um, well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Inside Tabletop. I am joined by my friend Mike Hutchinson today from Planet Smasher Games. Say hi to the crowd, Mike. Hello, everyone. I, I, I guess... I know you don't like this terminology, but the the thing that you are I probably most known for is being Gaslands, Mike, uh, and having, I would say, the runaway hit of, when was Gaslands out? Was it 2019, 2018? Yeah, seven, 2017 for the Blue Book. 2017. And a couple of years later in 19 for Refueled. Yeah, I don't mind being Gaslands, Mike. I'm, I'm you can be Gaslands, Mike. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Well, it, it's an interesting uh, story because my way that I've always described Gaslands from Osprey's point of view is it was their X-Wing. It was their thing that they didn't expect to be what it ended up being. And they they massively underestimated the popularity of this thing and made it a blue book and then had to like return to it later on and make it this like big, huge flush. I think it sold out like crazy. It was the most in demand. Like it had the most, from my point of view, people like messaging me being like, we want like Gaslands? Let's play some Gaslands. Let's make some Gaslands cars. Like people just showing up with Gaslands cars or we play something else and they'd have Gaslands cars. It had that real, there was a real energy behind its release. So you should be obviously very proud of it. Um, but you're here today to talk about your new venture because you have basically decided that you want to do your game design full time at Planet Smasher. And for the last few months, you've started kind of pulling the hood back or I guess the drapes back on what that looks like uh, on YouTube, on your social media and stuff like that. So I wanted to have you on today and talk to you about, well, what's that about? How'd you, how'd you get here? What was this, where, where is this journey going? And, and what was the decision that you wanted to start doing this full time? Yeah, I done quit my job, uh, mildly terrifying. So, okay, where to begin? So, I mean, the story starts with like, doing games design since I was like knee high to a grasshopper. Like when I was, when I was a kid and we were playing GW games, we couldn't afford them all, but we would read about them in White Dwarf. And so I was always making games to sort of, you know, we had a version of uh, Space Fleet. We had a version of Man of War. We played these games that, uh, that I used to write because we couldn't afford all of them. And yep. when, um, when I got back into designing probably around, I don't know, two, 2012, 2013, um, uh, I I got into the habit of designing a lot of games really fast, really bad games, because um, I'm, uh, I'm really influenced by a book called uh, The Frustrated Songwriter's Guide to Songwriting, which is not related to game design, but like has this incredible idea about how you break through creative blocks. There's a anyway, bunch of books like that. There's like those like the war on art. There's a bunch of things that they're not necessarily related to the thing you're doing, but you can find these parallels. Like I find On Writing by Stephen King and The War of Art mm. are both two books that very often come up with designers and people in this like creative space. Because even if it's not exactly mechanically what you're doing, the energy and the like feeling of it is the same. So that's really interesting. So why and, were you putting these out so fast? Well, so that book has this idea, it has a game in it, it's called the 20 song game. And you and some friends, you hook up for a specific Saturday and you, you call each other up in the morning and you give each other like 12 hours to write 20 songs from scratch and record them. And then you get together yeah. and you, and you play them to each other. And I loved it. And we did it a bunch when I was, when I was a, 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 a job in musician and I carried that forward into my like miniature game design. And so I was writing a lot of games and I was putting some of them into little PDFs and putting them online. And that's kind of how Gaslands happened. I was shopping around a different game, uh, Hobgoblin, and uh, I, <laughs> Phil was good enough to respond to my email with a, actually we've got Dragon Rampant about to come out. So Hobgoblin's not really a thing that we need right now. But right. he had taken a look at my games and found Gaslands and was like, actually, I'm really excited about doing kind of a toy car thing. Yeah, that that could be interesting. Let's talk about that. And since then, you know, I've been having this real tension between my utter passion and drive to make miniature games. I do it all the time, like irresistibly and uncontrollably with all of my spare brain power. And there comes a time when uh, 
there was a time when it was okay to manage that with work, uh, with the day right. job. And over the last couple of years, the day job's got more and more extreme in terms of its demands on my time and my creative energies. And I'd gotten to the point where I knew that this was my passion, but I wasn't finding a harmonious way to do it and the day job. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of factors came together over the last couple of years um, to get me to the point where I had a bit of money saved and I had a lot of uh, impetus to try and do this um, for myself. And really, I wanted to just shake up my own lifestyle and see if all of this passion that I had for miniature games, if I turned it on full time, could I make more of these games more quickly and actually make something sustainable for myself out of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I had it's put, funny. I can I, I can relate to that feeling, though, of like you're kind of at the end of your rope with what you're doing and you need to find a way to to move into something that you know you can do for longer because that's the, the pivot obviously here in the studio is all about that where just just displaying a game in a single genre for me for nine years had like hollowed out my love of those games and i have so many interests as you do right where you you have these things that like they cross pollinate even like they inspire each other like music inspires my writing film and tv inspires my gaming like all this stuff is is venn diagram to top of each other and so the pivot here in the studio has all been about how do i find like i can super relate to that how do i find that energy in a new way and then also take that risk of maybe i can actually do this full time and lo and behold there are people that actually want me to do that and i got really lucky so i'm super excited that that's that that's your starting place because i think that gives you the grounding and the tra trajectory of knowing why you're doing it. Like you're not just like shooting from the hip. It's like, no, this has to be this way. Cause I wasn't going to be able to do the thing I was doing forever anyway. And even if I'm not, even if it's hard in the beginning to do this, cause I have to acquire new skills or I have to do like a bunch of like new learning or teaching yourself audio engineering or whatever it ends up being that, that you, you find even more drive for that because it's leading to something, you know, you really want to do long-term. Exactly. And having that, kind of clarity on what the purpose is here has been really important as well as as I try and figure out in these opening couple of months what it is that I'm going to do with my time because one of the things that's absolutely true is that I love writing new games I'm actually I, I've, I think I've talked to you to you about this before but like I, I kind of don't like expanding my games very much or yeah, rather my brain doing it. doesn't my brain doesn't choose to do it. Like it's not something that I have endless ideas about new content. I'm excited by the alchemy of systems. Like how do you make a game explode from a set of unrelated mechanics? Mm -hmm. How do you take a, a movie image and like encapsulate that in this art form that is miniature gaming? Yeah, that's and, it's an experience for me. I look at I look at designing a game like shooting a movie, right? Mm -hmm. It has to like it, it's a movie that's going to play out differently every time. But I'm setting the scene and I'm setting the actions and I'm I'm calling the actual shots throughout the course of the game so that two people who aren't me can have a reasonable expectation of opening a book and then having that experience. And so if, like I'm the same way. I hate adding to it because it almost feels like doing a sequel to a movie that doesn't need a sequel. It's Jaws 3 but I, at yeah. some point for me, right? <laughs> right. And I guess th there's another potential way of looking at it, which is I'm not necessarily interested in building the next gaming engine. I want to make yeah. a little indie video game that is saying something and is complete in and of itself and that that game is you know the things that are in that game are there because the game experience needs it not because they're extensions wa waiting for for further content later on down the line or for and, and that satisfies that need in you right that gives you that satisfaction that makes you want to repeat that process it's that like if i because you get to the end of it and there's no there's a closure to it and there's like a sense of satisfaction and then you're ready to do it in some other way again it's like wrapping on a on a play yeah and so this this idea of creating new games and wanting to find a way like part, part of my process going into this was like trying to figure out when I spin out endless prototype games, like what's the what's the sub brand for me going to be like? Are these Planet Smasher pixels? Are these Planet Smasher early access? Is these like, f like what are these? Are these called shareware? Like what are these? Yeah, things? yeah, yeah. Because, it's like little sketches I, of games. Yeah, exactly. And because I want to make lovely boutique deluxe products and i'll kind of talk a bit about what i what i've got in my mind if if we want to but i also want to be able to just spin out like what's the current games design fixation that i've got and spin something out and so a lot of my planning around planet smasher games in these open couple of months trying to figure out what are the bits and pieces that i need 
in terms of you know channels and platforms and stuff to be able to both work on the, the stuff that I want to work on, but also give things to people that are cool, but maybe a bit rough around the edges in a way that's like, this is cool and rough around the edges. And if you're okay with that, come and, come and join in. Um, they might not go anywhere. They might turn into something lovely and deluxe in the future. But you're I'm you're gonna, such I'm a musician. Fun. You're such a musician. Cause you're, you're basically <laughs> like, I want to jam on all this stuff. And through the percolation of that, I'll chase out the things that turn into something bigger. But then I also want to have these like B sides and jam session things that people, cause it's for someone, it's going to be a work of art, right? Like whenever, like with music, even if some of my favorite songs are like B sides and like jam session songs that nobody never makes like a studio album, but they're like just these incredible songs. There's a song by Clutch called Steve Ducey that's like a song about like a Fox News broadcaster. <laughs> and it makes it's so like of its time and it makes no sense, but it's one of my favorite Clutch songs of all time. It's like it's it's a it's a weird little ballad that they like jammed out at Weathermaker at one point. And it, I, I love that I love that 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 psychology for you though because that's gonna bring you satisfaction. And if you can format it that way and and communicate that to people, I think there are gonna be people out there that really respond to that, where it's like, you've, you've clearly put the expectation of like, what am I doing and why? So that that's what they're then receiving. They're not expecting a finished rule book for every single one of these things, because some of them are these like passion projects you have. Yeah, and I think that's sort of led into the other uh, kind of leg of the stool that I'm imagining right now, which is I kind of figure, well, if I'm if I'm so excited about this sort of work in progress stuff, like how how can I best share the sort of sausage being made behind the scenes aspect of it? And so because you know because I don't mind talking to camera and I quite like video editing, I um, decided to lean into making regular YouTube content where I'm just kind of I'm just explaining and showing kind of what I'm what I'm working on and the. <laughs> and being very careful not to make any commitments to anyone so that as yeah. <laughs> from one project to another, you can just join me on that journey or not, whatever, it's cool. But. Yeah, well, I think that's super useful though because there's people out there that don't, like here, the, the thing that I always have to remind myself is everyone's process is different, everyone writes differently, everyone creates differently in all different genres. Mm -hmm. But there are things that when you are interested in being a creative, when you interact with the creatives and see their process, you will pick up a, a thing you never thought to look at in yourself. Like, how do I do this? Like one of the things I always got from talking to Joe McCullough, our mutual friend about Frostgrave was he has like a writing block for himself from like 10 o'clock in the morning until like noon. Cause he knows his brain is only useful during that period. And he just sets a clock and he writes during that time. And then he goes for a bike ride. He makes a sandwich. You know what I mean? Like he just, he mm. understands that like, I'm going to recharge and I might think about everything I just wrote for the rest of the day. But the actual writing time for me, I've identified I am not useful at any other period in the day. This is my writing time and like clockwork, I'm going to sit and write. And so he's so he's so prolific because he has this kind of like system for himself that he puts in place. That does not work for me at all. I am a I am a chaotic mess when it comes to writing for the most part. But there's a I think there's a real value in sharing that stuff for people because I think there's going to be someone out there that watches that and picks up something where they're like, I never thought about what time of day I write at. I never thought about mm you know, even like the materials I use, like, do I write on paper first or do I have a computer that's just for writing? So I'm not getting distracted. That was a big thing that, um, I talked about with Ivan Sorensen mm. from Nordic Weasel Games. He has to like have his space perfectly right in order to write. Cause otherwise there'll be a million things he wants to like poke at in his hobby room that'll like draw him away from it. He can't have other windows open and stuff. Um, <laughs> so that's really cool that you're sharing that. Yeah, I, um, <laughs> I've lost my train of thought. That's yeah, okay. I'm, exci I'm, exci I'm excited to share the work in progress stuff. And I am, like you, very chaotic. And so I'm quite careful with my... I'm quite careful with the media I consume because what happens to me is I catch a, a wind of an idea and then I will work for like six hours straight on a thing. Mm -hmm. And that can be like, because I watched a movie or I read a book or something and that is what inspired me. And so I'm quite cautious about triggering my kind of hyper obsessive uh, uh, focus on things. Yeah, your tunnel vision when you go when you go whole into an idea. Um, it's I have a question for you. Do you outline first, then fill in? Or do you just start writing from scratch and like conveyor belt out the the outline of like an idea like that when you sketch out a game. Because my big thing I, is I, I I Jervis Johnson all my stuff. I do headers and then that turns into my workflow where I fill in the headers underneath. So I just write out a million three to four word sections of a rule book where I have like the picture of the conveyor belt that needs to get filled in. And then I bang them out in the order I think I need to 
to get it functioning. And then I fill in the rest. And that's like my workflow of like how I do it. How do you, how do you start? I think mostly what I do is I have a playtest game in front of me and I'm and I'm writing in my paper notebook as I need the rules I'm writing the rules down and then because I've written so many rule books the structure of a miniature war game is like water to me it just flows out and so when I've got everything organized in my brain then I will tend to just sit down and write a first pass of the rule book you know probably 20 25 pages almost in a single flow state because um, if everything's organized in my brain and often that is not a very good version and it's got big gaps or big problems and then I'll go mm-hmm. back and you know endlessly sort of rescan through that and, and make it better but yeah I, t- I think that's 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 why I like that's why I'm quite cautious about triggering that flow state because I, I yeah. am very good at doing something in, in one lump and if I get distracted and if I pick the wrong moment in time where I've got like only half an hour before I need to go pick up the kids or something then yeah, I can yeah. lose the mojo yeah, I love that you put models down first. I have never heard of anyone doing that before. That is, it's so funny that you said you're like, I put the models down and then as I'm moving the models around, I start writing on paper. That's a that's a super, I, I, I would love to hear more about that. You should do a whole episode about that because I think that's, that's something I've, in all the designers I've ever talked to, that's not a thing that I'd consider doing. That's completely fresh to me. I would huh. love to hear how that, how that approach works for you. I mean, it's... T- I mean, I, I always talk about myself as almost like a model maker first. Like my my career in this space started with like plastic airplanes and airfix kits. Sure. And so like, I like the cinematography, the miniature c- cinematography of the table. I'm the same way. Yeah, yeah, I'm the same way. I imagine what the models are going to be first and, and then I write the game around what I want to be on the table. But I don't actually put it down there like you do, which I think is really interesting. Well, I mean, I guess the other thing is I, I really truly feel that like, these games are about the relationships between the physical objects if they're not then it's not a miniature game in in, in this way so like maybe i'm not as uh skilled at like visualizing that mentally and so i have to sort of explore it in a tactile way Mm. but for me that's you know i i want to feel the relationships i want to feel in sort of physically what's going on with these pieces so that like if i'm working on a a game with with spaceships like how far away should the spaceships does it feel right that the spaceship Mm -hmm. is this far away or that far away you're blocking you're doing blocking Hmm. you're blocking a shot basically before you actually write out the script which is just super interesting you're you're like cinematographer before script which is like that's that's a super interesting workflow i love that visual director yeah, yeah, it's tone poem first, and then we figure out how the tone poem is going to actually operate. I fucking love that. That's amazing. Um, so, the, so the other, so go on. I was going to say the the other thing uh, that's given me some confidence and some uh, some drive to share my work in progress uh, and and talk early about games. You know, long before probably conventionally it would be practical or reasonable to talk about a game because like you can't buy it from me. Um, is that the the endless. Um, the endless work that uh, Glenn Ford and I've been doing on chewing on games design questions in the rule of carnage has built up its own community. And there's this really um, fantastic uh, games designer community that we've built up on Discord. And so that gave me the positive energy that I got from sharing processes and talking about some of the theory of miniature games design gave me a lot of desire to be like okay well i've talked a lot about the theory of the practice let me show the practice in action let me show what i what i mean when i say like i'm messing around with activation systems like here's me tr- testing two activation systems and kind of musing on them in real time about yeah how they're working and so that that kind of feedback loop between and this was happening even as far back as the the original gaslands blue book like thinking about games design writing blogging you know vlogging about games design and then feeding that back in like i kind of I'm so obsessed with that stuff that I'm so obsessed with the craft as a craft that I kind of want that to be. I mean, it's all we talk about. It's we're like, we're like stand up comics when we get together. We, I mean, that was what blaster was. It was literally just an excuse for the five of us to sit around. Like it was you, me, Sean, Joe. Yeah, exactly. And, and Joey, and we would sit around and we would talk shop and, we got about like five minutes of blaster work done every time. And then we would just talk about what we're all working on because it's, we're like, we're like, we're like record store nerds or movie nerds. When we get together, we want to, we want to, we want to pull it all apart and look at it because that's the, the fascinating part is what it's, it's not just what the end point experience is for the user. It's how do you make that end point experience exactly what you envisioned when you started and mm. we're obsessive about it. And I think that was, I think that was the, the beauty of that for me was getting to share that with you guys and having that, 
that 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 experience of hey here's a bunch of people all around the world who all have stumbled into the same like motivating force and then you get to sit around and talk about it so what does this mean for your existing catalog though because obviously you've got a bunch of published games that are out there right now what do you what do you what do you envision maybe the future for those would be so i think the the, the fun element here is that i've got all of these game ideas and not a ton of them as i've said are expansions for the existing games but at the same time like there's no you know there's no you, you mentioned at the beginning like i'm gaslands mike there's no denying that like gaslands yeah. is the runaway success uh and i you know I'm frankly not going to have another game as big as that unless I'm real freaking lucky. And I, I don't imagine <laughs> uh, for a second that's going to be the case. So what I'm trying to do is trying to figure out how to balance um, working on and supporting those games that are already out there and have players and have communities with building communities around new games and what that means. Because I don't want people who have played Gaslands or A Billion Sons to feel like, oh, Mike swanned off and he's going to do something else. Yeah. But at the same time, I have to be realistic about where the money's going to come to pay for the mortgage and to feed my kids. And mm -hmm. um, royalties on books from mass market publishers isn't the answer. Like it's part of the answer, but it can only be yeah. part of the answer. And so for me, you know, on a practical level, I'm thinking, okay, well, how can I combine... Um, a a community of patreon backers who wants to see what i'm working on who wants to see me working on this kind of stuff with a um a more like in mike's control premium way of delivering uh my new games where there right. is no you know ownership question and that for me feels like kickstarter is an incredible way for me to get a really really premium produced product because you know uh, Glenn Ford, who I who I do the Rule of Carnage podcast with, he's made, I think it's seven or eight like Chinese produced, you know, lovely quality board yeah. games from from long pack games who do a bunch of games that that you and I would recognize. And yeah. so I I can I can kind of lean on on a friend's experience to get to market with something that is you know just feels like a board game feels real nice package you know good mm -hmm. cardboard punch out tokens or templates you know nice quality printing rule book everything that you would need to play one of my games barring the miniatures in a lovely sort of deluxe box set mm -hmm. but the thing is that that doesn't necessarily work in a situation where i've already got a relationship with offspray for gaslands or so forth right, without right, thinking right. about how <clears throat> how we can figure out like a, a solution where everybody wins in that situation yeah and so to a degree, like I've got to just be really cautious about how I balance the time because it's just me, and it's just like there's five days in the week, and I've got That's to figure it. out what to do with those five days. And one of those five days, a video. you're only doing five days. Oh my god, I didn't know there's only five days. No one told me that. <laughs> try, like I'm trying, I'm trying to be real cautious here. That's I, aspirational, I, man. That's aspirational. Five. If I get to six I quit days, my I'll be happy. So it's not to go to get burnt out again. <laughs> it's fair um it does sound like though you do have the opportunity now by having this forum to talk about those games and use them as reference points for the new things that you're making and that's really exciting because i think that's that's what that's what the gaslands mic is going to mean to your audience is what is where, where what's the journey for me what has this led to how is what my experience was making gaslands led me here to planet smasher and led me here to to, to having like a, a way that it feels when you play a Mike Hutchinson game. And that's a, that's a huge opportunity for you because with traditional publishing, the thing I noticed is you kind of put it out there in the world and it's in a bottle. And unless you mm. meaningfully engage with it yourself, it's just in that bottle and it's perceived as it is when it rolls off the printing press. With Planet Smasher, you can now like take control of that whole conversation and be like, this is the evolution of me as a game designer. Here's how I iterate on my thought process and, and, and Gaslands customers will get more from you and players will get more from you just by listening to you talk about it. You know what I mean? It's not like you don't even have to make new Gasland stuff right away in Plant Smasher's point of view. You can just be talking about it and referencing it in all of your other sort of projects and passions that you're chasing. Yeah, that that is right. And I think like being realistic about like the, the way that I got to Gaslands was writing lots of games and the way that Gaslands, it, like the reason Gaslands is in the form it is right now is because I stopped writing it and I kind of left it the shape it is. And it, it you know, it, it hasn't suffered from 
I don't perceive that it's suffered from like a lack of constant releases. Like it's still being played no. to the level that I need it to be played without having like constant meta shifting updates to it. Because I just don't think it's, you know, that's not the kind of game I'm ever going to make. And it's also not the game, the kind of game that I choose to build. Like I'm not building a business that would be able to support that. And and it's it's also just, not the people you've attracted. The people you've attracted are are social. Gaslands is by nature a social game. It requires more than one person and arguably is at its best with tons of people. So it's mm. funny how it's funny how I think I think the social component of what you've made is such a huge factor in it having like a longevity and it kind of fighting back against that diminishing return of like once something's out there, people have it. Because you don't necessarily come back. It's it's not like you're making StarCraft. You're not trying to make the perfect game, right? Where people play the perfect game and they meta their clicks down to the second. You're trying to make a mm. game where the the overall experience it escalates and gets more fun the more times you do it with the more people it's with because it's so chaotic and and to me that feels like it future proofs gaslands it if you never touched it again people would still be enjoying gaslands at some point because it is ultimately about the activity of all standing around a table smashing cars together and that that's what people <laughs> come back for regardless of the rules right right although having said that there are some there are some real uh, changes that I would love to make. If I'm sure to have another swing. We all hate something about our games. For me, it was dogs in last days. Everyone thought I hated dogs because they had a real problem with the dog rules in that game. And I do not hate <laughs> dogs, but <laughs> dogs are my white whale. Apparently writing rules for dogs is like, I got more hate mail about the dogs in last days, not being able to run than almost anything in any, anything I've ever designed in my entire life to like my dog could open a door and I'm like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Like I don't, I don't know that I would offend you over dogs. Yeah, there's always things I would change. Yeah, I, I just needed the dogs to have a skill where they could become a smart boy or a good boy, and then they could do all the all the actions as opposed to just one action. <laughs> so the other thing about like retrospecting on how Gaslands got to where it was, like it's not um, necessarily the major part of its success, but community building around the open beta of Gaslands was a really important early stage in like achieving some kind of organic kind of liftoff for the game. So when people f saw the game just after it had come out, there was already like a good history of people making cars and posting like hobby stuff because there'd been sort of 300 of us all chewing on the game leading up to that. And each game that I choose to release, it can't linearly increase the amount of like community management and social stuff that I do it just that's not practical for me so I also need to find a way with Planet Smasher Games gives me this opportunity to sort of say well come join the sort of jump on the mic boat for playing miniature games and I will tell you mm -hmm. all the things that's going on with that and some of them will be Gaslands related and some of them won't be um, but like there's always going to be a party because it's like some stuff's going on um, and so I don't know that I've found the mechanisms for that in these first couple of months yet, but like trying to figure out how I can, again, be sustainable in the way that I'm generating community interest, because ultimately mm -hmm. these games, they are social and they live or die with whether you can find an opponent or find other people to infuse about um, for this sort of out of game hobby stuff. Um, it feels like we should be starting a luminary. You know what I mean? Like, it feels like that's what kind of what you want as an outgrowth of this community wise is where luminary is that thing where like a creator does like a series of videos or, or instructionals or even just like testimonials on doing a thing that they are a luminary at. And then you can sign up to hang out and hear that person's POV on a certain like type of whatever it is that their craft is, whether it's writing or cooking or whatever it ends up being. It, it almost feels like that's a, that's a, that's like a logical outgrowth of Planet Smasher is some type of like patrons, like luminary thing where you get this like, more curated content and maybe even doing planet smasher is a way that you will filter out what that looks like in the future. Right. Cause you'll have done so many of these videos that you're like, Oh, I come back to this topic all the time and people ask lots of questions about this topic. And then that gets boiled into something that you do. Cause you are like, you are one of the most, it's funny because you say you're scatterbrained, but you are actually one of the most organized game designers. I know <laughs> from the point of view of you take it seriously as a craft um, mm. where lots of us, I take it seriously as a craft, but I, but I, but I Venn diagram it into other things that I make. Uh, you look at game design in itself as being like a thing you can master. And so I think that that's what I'm excited about for Plant Smasher is that watching you cook off the stuff that's just like your inspiration where you're kind of a dog chasing a car 
into these kind of like thought kernels might be something that that's valuable for people watching this right now and then in the future yeah i think that's right i think that is the core of everything is that i am obsessed with the craft of games design and i feel it's not like a it's not like a religious crusade where i feel like it hasn't been recognized and it needs to be recognized but like it I, i'm just obsessed with talking about it and thinking about it and um I think there are lots of other things like model making and graphic design and you know that uh, that all kind of orbit around it and that making a game product needs some of all of those things but at its kernel the thing that i'm obsessed with is the like actual alchemy of mm -hmm. how you get some dice and some cards and some miniatures and somehow some magic happens and you feel feelings yeah it's the manual that gets you there right like all the other stuff mm. is an expression of that original sort of like concept and and the craft of making it in such a form that you can give it to a stranger mm. and they do or don't get the experience you intended i think to me that's the real like that is what I am permanently chasing in game design is mm. I am permanently chasing. Did you does is the feeling that I intended what came out of you reading that book without me ever touching your experience? And and there mm. is there is craft there. I think that's a that's an important thing that I hope people watching you pick up through that dialogue. And what you said about community, I think, is super important because the the back and forth of dialogue to with the end user while the, there's a whole other conversation we could have about there about playtesting and getting feedback and mm -hmm. stuff like that, having that dialogue in your underlying thought process where it's not related to necessarily like a rule or a mechanic, those are examples of what your thought process is, not the actual thing that's the discussion topic. It's so mm -hmm. valuable to hear what the end user thinks about that because it distills down, I think, that, that information for them and for you. I get more insight out of someone saying, I really had a good time when X or Y happened or, you know what I mean? Like this really surprised me when this happened and it really felt like the scene from a movie or this thing happening or whatever it is. And you're like, yes. <laughs> like, and you, and you carry that forward into the next thing that you make. So what about your inspiration? So where you've obviously, you've obviously got a, a, a start here that you've gone on to what's your, what do you, what would you like this to look like? Who, like who's inspiring you? What would you like this to look like? Where are you, were you drawing your energy to, to, to do this from? So, uh, was it last year or was it even the year before I got an opportunity in the last 18 months to travel to California? Um, I was going for business, but I extended the trip by a week so that I could hang out with our good buddy, Sean Sutter. Yeah. Yeah. And we Skyped, I, we Skyped with you from, from his garage. It was like 150 degrees. <laughs> yeah. And, I just hung out with Sean and his dog and his family um, and, uh, you know, kind of watched him, watched him working. We played some, some playtest games of a couple of things that we were both working on secret projects at the time. Um, we played some Hobgoblin, we played some Relic Blade. And I was really interested in continuing the conversation with Sean about how he's talked about it a bit, but like he came out of a fine art background yeah. and that, particular crucible has given him a specific world view and a way of looking at what he does as sort of just a natural extension of his art which you know it, it, you, you choose a medium and sometimes you choose multiple mediums um and then you try and express yourself and you try and find people who are interested in looking at that yeah. direction or experiencing that expression and um i'm really i was just really fascinated by that and it really it sort of balmed my soul as I began to listen to it and think about it more because I've come from a pretty hectic um, sort of tech startup, you know, sales corporatized, driven, yeah, endless, endless like iteration of products and stuff. And all of that stuff is like I'm carrying that experience into Planet Smasher and it's like endless sort of, you know, test early, release quickly kind of yeah. a thing. But at the same time, it just opened my eyes to something which I actually think for video games, having worked with a bunch of video game people recently, many more than I had in the past, like it's also really apparent there, which is that at its heart, m many people working in these creative industries think first as a creative artistic individual yeah. and then kind of fit themselves into the, the, the world that needs to operate as a business in order to make that craft kind of, viable reach yeah, yeah reach a big audience or if you're making something complicated like a movie or a big video game like make it even viable to even produce that well it's but, it's it's i think it's the artist expression of i love doing this 
I'll do anything to be able to keep doing this. You know what I mean? And then you That's find right. out the way that you're able to, 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 to do it so that you can not stop. That's right. And, you know, I think I, I introspected on the things that Sean had said. And I thought, well, actually, given the success of Gaslands, given my kind of visibility as a designer through Blaster and through Rule of Carnage, like, I feel like I'm in a situation where I've got enough credibility that I could I could totter out and try and make a stand at this. And, and, and very much like not wanting to say, okay, Planet Smasher is going to, you know, hire its first three people by the end of the year. And we're going to be shipping product yeah. into Target by the end of next year. And like, I don't want any of that. What I want is to be able to make pots in my studio and sell those pots to people that like pots, except the pots are miniatures games. And I don't preach. Sell miniatures. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, bars <laughs> that was that was for, for real though that is that is that is the thing that i think armors us as creative people is if you can if you can wrap yourself in the 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 daringness of trying to do that your success is inevitable my my big thing is that that i burn the boats on every shore i land on I just, I do it. I burn them <laughs> behind me because I will fail otherwise, but I burn every fucking boat and, and then I don't have an option except to succeed, right? Except mm -hmm. to try something until I, until I do it. And I think that you, I think that's a great inspiration to draw from Sean because he is, he is the, I think an archetype of a person who is endlessly creative, has no fear of pushing that creativity into things he doesn't know how to do yet and mm. is in is enriched by i think the the journey that he's on and and is one of like the happiest people i know i think because of it so that's a that's a great that's a great place to draw some of that inspiration from i think because you don't know what this is yet right like you you're you're at the beginning of this it could be it could still be in lots of different shapes and you're so open to that that's that's really powerful and i think you know it's also there's a flavor of like a, an existential midlife crisis where i would like to be myself and broadcast myself and being Planet Smasher games and designing and getting excited about half finished crackpot miniature game ideas. Like that is me and I can just be myself now. And I don't have to like, I'd never had to turn up in a suit and tie, but like, you know, yeah. mentally. It, it was hoodies and it was hoodie, and hoodies and Adidas slides all around in tech. Right. That's all it was. Um, but, but, but that's the thing uniform. is like, it's still a uniform. It's still, it is still a uniform. <laughs> it's just a different kind of uniform. Yeah. But, but here's the thing is every single person, and, and this is to give you some, some future sort of confidence. Every single person that's been on inside tabletop so far has burned the boats and succeeded. Every single one for more than a decade. So think about He's that. Cursing me. I'm not. I'm not. It's 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 the fact that if if that is your goal, then then I think you are it, it, like the the number one thing is having that mindset of knowing what you want to be doing, and then the rest of it is just the 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 detail, right? It's just the detail of figuring out what that looks like and casting away what doesn't work and pulling in what does work and then figuring out where it comes forward because. I would say that is the common thread so far. You are amongst people who have all taken the same sort of risk. Um, not so much as like, I shouldn't say risk. They've all dared basically to follow their passion into something that ends up supporting them in a way they can keep doing it. And that's, that's a universal attribute basically of everybody who's been on here. So I'm excited for you, man. I think it's gonna be great. Yeah, that's all I, that's all I want. That's all I want. Sweet. I mean, it's, well, it's a, it, yeah. Well, we, we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about the long game in the next one of these, <laughs> which I'm excited about because that's that's gonna be a fun that's gonna be a fun conversation because um, we're gonna have another video that's gonna come out next week that you guys will see um, about basically talking about how to how to do something like this by yourself um, and what it looks like when like what are the markers basically of 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 how you're overextending yourself and how you might be burning out from what you do. And it's, it's kind of a, it's a very interesting conversation because it's about being creative in the long term, And I'm super excited to talk to you about it. So man, I, I am, I am so excited for you. I want all the best things for you. This is a, this is a really cool journey for you. Hopefully at some point you'll have, I guess you won't have excuse of business in Ontario, but maybe you can come to the studio and we'll have, a, <laughs> we'll, I'll, I'll have air conditioning, which Sean did not have, but <laughs> you can see Niagara Falls. One, Just talk your, talk your wife into coming to see Niagara Falls. Yeah, one marker of success will be whether I can afford airfares to decent uh, conventions over in uh, North America. So perfect. Yeah, well, you can fly in here and we'll drive maybe. 
Nice. All right, sweet. Well, thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you next week for another Inside Tabletop. Thanks for Mike coming on. Thank you bye for having everybody. me. Yeah, bye, everybody. Thanks so much for watching another Inside Tabletop. Uh, or listening, of course, if you are a patron on the patron-exclusive podcast feed. If you want to find out more about what Mike has going on, you can check out his Patreon and, of course, Planet Smasher Games website, both linked in the video description. Have a great day.